Young Money blog and author of the upcoming book, Own It, How Our Generation Can Invest Our Way to a Better Future. Welcome to my presentation for a master investor, How to Own Your Financial Future. This presentation is going to provide you with a very quick overview of the issues that I explore in Own It. So it's ideal for anybody who's just starting their investing journey and wants to understand the options that are available to them in a little bit more detail. But as I say, it's a very high level summary. So make sure you go away and do your own research about these options after this presentation. Obviously as well, I would encourage you to get a copy of Own It. I'll explain how you can pre-order it at the end. And also remember, I'm not a professional financial advisor. I'm not qualified or regulated to give financial advice. So please do seek out financial advice if you have specific questions about your situation following this presentation. Let's get started. First of all, why should we invest? Well, firstly, poor savings rates mean you are losing money in real terms. Hopefully, you broadly understand the difference between saving and investing. Saving is when you put your money on deposit in the bank. And if your bank is regulated and covered by the financial services compensation scheme, then your money is protected up to the value of £85,000. So you invest, so you save to protect your money. When you invest, you are putting your money in the stock markets in the hope that it will grow more in the long term. Now, when you invest, your capital is at risk, your money can go up as well as down, and you might not get back what you put in. However, that's not to say that saving is risk free. There is such a thing as reckless conservatism. And that basically means that if inflation is uh, higher than the interest that you earn on your savings, then you are in real terms losing money. Inflation is the rate at which prices rise in the real economy. And it doesn't have to be that high for you to really lose out if all your money is in your savings. So while saving matters, it's not where you should have all your long term money. The stock market has traditionally provided better returns than savings. Since the start of the 21st century, um, if you invest over any 30 year time period, um, then you should get an average annual return from the stock market of 6%, and that's after inflation. That is a lot better than the rate offered on most savings accounts these days. Um, there are no guarantees, um, and just because that's been the average rate of return in the stock market up till now, doesn't mean it will definitely be the same rate in the future, but it does give you a guide. It gives you a fairly good idea of what to expect. So typically we can expect the stock market to perform better than savings accounts. It sounds strange, but this might actually be the best time to start investing. Um, over the past 10 years, we have seen stock markets rise consistently, and this is known as a bull run, but that came to an end earlier this year in early 2020, when stock markets crashed. Um, but that had the advantage of um, making shares look very cheap again. Prior to that crash, the stock market was looking very expensive. So over the long term, if you start investing when the value of shares is by historical standards very low, and then when you sell in the future when those shares are reaching a higher value, then that's the way that you grow your money in the long term. When you invest, your money has a purpose and power in the real economy. You are a shareholder, you own part of that company, you have a voice, you have a right to be hired, and therefore you can drive companies in a better direction. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can do that later. Finally, investing has never been more accessible or egalitarian. Um, thanks to the smartphone and a much more competitive investing market these days, investing is no longer just available to the super wealthy and those with privileged access to stock market information and sophisticated technology. Pretty much anybody who has got, you know, a few hundred or a few thousand quid to invest can start through their smartphone uh, in a matter of minutes, which is fantastic. Um, the industry is not perfect um, by any means and in fact the internet in some ways has made investing more confusing and more hazardous today but i think that if you can figure out how to make it work for you um, then investing uh, has never been more accessible and it presents a lot of exciting possibilities for young people today 
Now, before you start investing, you need to make sure that you have nailed your priorities across all three time frames. Being good with money means keeping all these time frames in your mind and not neglecting any one of them. Obviously, there will be times where you might have to prioritize one time frame over another. Uh, but generally speaking, it really pays to make sure that you are thinking about the short term, the medium term and the long term. So have a look at the uh, suggestions that I have put in these three time frames. Maybe take a screenshot and make a note of these and see how you can work towards fulfilling goals across all three of these time frames, um, because that is going to ensure that you have a good balance of savings investments and pensions to fulfill your goals um, in the short term, medium term and long term. To own or not to own. Now, this presentation is not about housing. It's a huge subject and I can't do justice to it here. But as a quick summary, I think that buying should be a personal choice. It's not just an investment, it's your home and that all of us are going to rent at some point in our lives. So um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think it's important to uh, not feel ashamed of, of renting if, if you are still in that situation. But generally speaking, supply does continue to outstrip demand in the housing market. So that means that if you buy the right property for you in the right place with good transport links and amenities at the right price, so it's not overvalued, um, and you then um, stay in that home for a decent period of time, ideally not buying you know, at the top of the housing market, um, then your house is going to maintain its value and hopefully increase in value. So at some point in the future, you can sell it at a profit and move up the housing ladder. And the biggest advantage of home ownership is the chance to pay down your housing costs by paying off your mortgage. You don't have that option with renting. And in fact, if you are a lifelong renter, you're going to have to pay nearly twice as much into your pension uh, just to have the retirement income that you expect. So getting on the housing ladder can actually be quite good for your pension prospects too. I would just advise you to avoid using help to buy and shared ownership, which are complicated schemes with lots of strings attached, and to try and save up for longer, to save at least 10% of the deposit required, because then you are going to have uh, access to much better value mortgages as well. And the, and the mortgage that you are paying off over time is not going to be so onerous either. Let's talk about the P word, pensions. I'm not very keen on the word pension. I think it's quite off-putting to a lot of younger people. And it's very difficult today uh, to imagine what our retirement will look like. But I think all of us are going to want to retire, even if it's partially retire one day. Um, and we need to start saving for that point in the future now. So maybe think about it as a future fund, if that appeals to you a bit more, uh, whether it's a pension or a future fund, either way, you need to start thinking about how to maximize it now. So the first question to ask yourself is, are you a full-time employee? If so, then you will be opted into a workplace pension if you're earning over 10,000 pounds and over the age of 22. Uh, don't opt out of it. You're getting free DOSH from your employer and tax relief. If possible, try and contribute more. If you um, are able to take advantage of matching contributions, that means the more that you pay in, the more your employer pays in. So that's win-win. Find out where your pension is vested, we'll cover that later, and open a private pension to contribute extra money, um, and that way you are really boosting your retirement pot. If you're not a full-time employee, you can set up a private pension and then top it up with a lifetime ISA. The lifetime ISA is a product that's available to the under 40s who want to either buy their first home or save for their retirement. If you decide to use a lifetime ISA for your first home, um, then then that's one thing. However, if you're self-employed and maybe are already on the property ladder, you might want to consider it as an additional pension fund because you can put £4,000, up to £4,000 a year into your LISA and you get 25% on whatever you put into it uh, in the form of a bonus, a free bonus from the government. So that's up to a grand free a year from the government. That's a pretty good deal. So make sure you look into the Lifetime ISA if you're self-employed. Also check out NEST, the National Employment and Savings Trust, which was set up after auto-enrolment was introduced um, because that offers an option for the self-employed too. And if you're feeling brave, you might want to explore self-invested personal pensions or SIPs. If you're not sure how much to contribute into your pension, then um, think about the uh, contribution rate as being half your age. So if you're 30 years old, 
a 15% contribution rate is ideal. And that isn't all your money, that can be your employer's money in there too. Um, if you can't contribute that much, then don't worry too much, but uh, try to put into your pension whatever you can. Lots of us will be wanting to make our pensions um, as socially responsible as possible. But how can you do that? Well, firstly, research your pension funds investments, go online, go on the pension portal that should be available to you through your employer um, and find out what their top 10 investments are. Clarify your deal breakers. What really matters to you? Um, because no company will be perfect and no pension fund will be perfect. It may be invested in certain sectors or have certain business practices that you might not be so happy with. Uh, but try to clarify what, what's really important to you. Work out if you're part of a master trust, a group pe personal pension or defined personal pension. Um, you can find out more information about that um, through your employer. And if you're self-employed, obviously you'll have to go through either a self-invested personal pension or you can open a private pension with the likes of Nutmeg that have ethical options. Make your voice heard. Um, as Greta Thunberg says, no one is too small to make a difference. Now, we've talked a little bit about why you should invest um, and how to uh, think about the basics like your housing and your pension. But let's talk now about how, how to invest. First of all, the most important thing to suss out is what your investing vehicles will be. This is how you're going to embark on your investing journey. Now, the two main investing vehicles are your ISA and your pension. I've already talked quite a lot about your pension, um, but that essentially has um, tax relief worth up to, if you contribute up to £40,000 a year, then you will qualify for tax relief on that. Um, and the other option to think about is your ISA. You get an ISA allowance of £20,000 a year, and the two main options are your stocks and shares ISA and your lifetime ISA, which I've already talked about. And obviously make sure you're taking care of your uh, savings. You can uh, save into a cash ISA or a regular savings account. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, either is absolutely fine. Um, you will get um, a quite decent uh, allowance, tax-free allowance for the interest that you earn on your savings these days. Um, just make sure that uh, if you get a innovative finance ISA, um, that you go into it with your eyes open, peer-to-peer -peer and crowdfunding are not options that I have got time to discuss here, uh, but they come with their own risks. Um, so you can have an IF ISA alongside your stocks and shares and lifetime ISA, but um, it's a bit more of a niche option. Choosing your route. There are three main routes to think about. Uh, Robo-advisors are otherwise known as digital wealth managers, and they provide ready-made portfolios based on your appetite for risk and your goals. Um, they use mostly cheaper exchange traded funds and they sometimes offer ethical and theme portfolios. The main advantage is they are great for beginner investors. They are a way for you to just start investing and get help for your investments, particularly if you're quite time poor and you don't really have the capacity to go out and manage your own investments. But I would say that robo advice is not the same as regulated financial advice, because when you go to see a real financial advisor in the flesh, um, so long as they're regulated, then you will get personalized recommendations based on your situation. And if that advice turns out to be unsuitable, then you will get compensation. There is no such protection available with the service that a lot of robo-advisors offer, which is basically guidance. So check if your robo-advisor is offering regulated financial advice. Also be aware that what you're getting is more limited um, and not as comprehensive as uh, with investment platforms. These are otherwise known as DIY platforms or fund supermarkets, and they allow investors to build their own portfolios. And they offer access to pretty much the whole universe of investments out there. All the asset classes, the funds, the investment vehicles that we've discussed before, like ISAs and pensions, um, everything that you could possibly want. And they do offer portfolios, although um, they often don't come with the same questionnaires that robo-advisors will offer. And you can buy and sell your investments in real time. It's a very well-established, solid sector that offers you know, the best possible access really to the investment galaxy out there. But there are huge variations in the cost, tech and service of these platforms, and they often come with quite unclear high charges. 
um, and the portals can be quite na uh, complex to navigate. Then there's free trading apps. This is a relatively new sector, um, it's typically app first, and they will offer a more limited range of stocks, exchange traded funds, investment trusts. So no mutual funds are on offer through free trading apps. And typically this is through a freemium model, i.e. get quite a basic service for a low cost. And then if you want to upgrade and access a, a wider range of investments, you'll have to pay a higher monthly fee. And they also make their profits from cross-selling riskier investments like derivatives and cryptocurrency. And there's a big emphasis on high growth, sexy US stocks that I'm sure you've heard of like Facebook, Netflix, Apple, Tesla. Um, so they do offer this quick and relatively cheap way to buy into those uh, stocks and their growth. They're very user friendly um, and it can be a very good way to build your own confidence around investing. But I'm not so fond of the very selective and slanted model that they offer. It's a relatively limited range of investments compared to traditional investment platforms. And I feel a lot of uh, these apps encourage short term risky behavior whereby you're, in, you're buying into sexy, well known brands in the hope that they'll continue to go up. But that's not really what investing is about, as I'll explain later. You'll also need to decide whether you want to go passive or active. I haven't really got time to explain in detail what these two different camps offer, um, but essentially passive investing is when you allow robots to track an index, which is a basket of comparative assets. The most famous index you'll probably have heard of is the FTSE 100, which are the 100 most uh, valued companies in the UK today. So that's passive investing. But if you decide to go active, really, that is all about um, investing in either a mutual fund or an investment trust. And these are managed by uh, managers who um, will charge a fee, uh, hopefully to try and beat the index. You've got to make a call about whether they can actually do that or whether you as an individual can manage your own portfolio of assets, which comprise of shares, commodities, bonds, lots of others that I can't go into here, but the main uh, constituent building blocks of your portfolio or your uh, fund portfolio will be uh, shares, commodities and bonds. In shares, you'll also have um, income producing shares which pay dividends on a regular basis uh, throughout the year, or there'll be shares where you're hoping to buy at this value, uh, hold it for a certain period of time and then sell it at a higher value. If you decide to put your faith in an active fund manager, whether they're managing um, a, a mutual fund or an investment trust, remember not to rely on best buy lists because they may not always tell you what the most consistently uh, high performing funds are. And watch out for charges because they really eat into your returns. One of the advantages of passive investing is that it is cheaper um, than active investing. And managers have mandates, make sure they stick to them because if they drift away from them, then they might not be making good decisions. Um, and they may be um, moving into areas where they're less experienced um, and that could lead to your funds underperforming. And finally, dangers to look out for. Big tech bias, i.e. just investing in the big technology companies, they're not the only game in town. Buying brands you love, just because you like a company doesn't mean that it's a good long-term investment. Think about those less exciting and more boring companies out there. Forex trading, derivatives and Bitcoin are not options I would ever recommend to beginner investors because they are more akin to gambling. You're speculating on the future price of the investments, which are completely unknown. And mini bonds are not the same as savings bonds. They are investment bonds and you have got no guarantees about whether you're going to get your money back. And in general, be skeptical about schemes promising high returns above 5%. So finally, my seven golden rules for investing. Diversify, invest for the long term, trip feed your money rather than put in big lump sums. Don't follow the crowd, have your own strategy and stick to it. If in doubt, trade less, not more, especially on certain days when the markets are going crazy. Keep a cool head because you are doing this for the long term. And if it's too good to be true, then it probably is. And really, why should you invest? Here's a reminder, you can either plod on, overworked and underpaid, waiting for others to make things better for you, or you can take charge of your long-term money and decide your own destiny. You can own it. And that's what my book is all about. If you want to pre-order it, it's available now on Amazon, Waterstones and Harriman House. 
Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.